Nikon cameras have not known to have good video for a very, very long time. And I know that many people who have been using Nikon for a long time are also more photography oriented and not as familiar with video. But with the recent release of video powerhouses like the Z8, the Z9 and the Z6 III, I think this has all changed. And a lot of people who have been using Nikon cameras, they want to get into the video game now and they want to learn how to do good video properly on their Nikon cameras. So in this video, we will learn how to unlock the video capabilities of the Nikon Z6 III. And I think these can be brought over to other cameras as well like the Z8 or the Z9. So how do you get into the video mode? If you look at the back of the camera right at the top there, you can actually flick the switch down from photo mode to video mode. That one is fairly straightforward. So when you flick the switch down to video mode, you are basically um, accessing the video functions of the camera. Now, which mode should you use? You know, PASM. Um, I know in photography, you know, some people are used to shooting in um, fully automatic mode or aperture priority or shutter priority. But for video, we are going to be sticking to M mode or manual mode the entire time. I think this is especially important because in video, you really do want full manual control over all of your settings. So nothing is, um, you know, automatic in video mode. Then let's talk about cards or storage. So at the side, on the right hand side of the Nikon Z6 III, you will notice that there are two card slots. One is an SD card slot and the other one is a CF Express Type B. What I do highly recommend is that you get yourself a CF Express Type B card. Why? Because if you're going to be shooting at higher resolutions and frame rates, you will need the speed to write all that data into that card. Um, if you don't understand what all this means, you know, if you don't understand frame rates and frame sizes, don't worry, I'll be getting there later on. And if you look at the exterior of my camera, you will notice that there's this outer metal covering and that's called a camera cage. So why should you get a camera cage? Well, besides for the obvious reason of protecting the uh, exterior of your camera, it allows you to mount many different kinds of accessories onto the camera itself. Video production is quite unlike um, photography. It's not just the camera and the lens that you need. Very often you will need a bunch of other different accessories like microphones, rails, or maybe some small lighting equipment on your camera as well. And these kinds of cages um, offer different mounting points for all these different accessories that you might need for video production. So if you are looking to be like a one man run and gun kind of shooter, I do recommend getting a camera cage so that you can slowly start building up your camera rig in the future. Okay, so now let's access the video menu of the Nikon Z6 III. If you were to turn on your camera and you scroll down, um, you know, you press the menu option, you scroll down to the second option, that's where you access the video recording menu. And in the video recording menu, um, you know, you'll see a bunch of different things that we are going to go through, but let's skip over the first few options, things like your storage folder or file naming, um, things like that, those are fairly obvious. We'll go into the very first option that let's, uh, we'll talk about, which is the video file type. So if you click and enter into video file type, you will be met with a bunch of different options. And we will be explaining what each of these mean. So your first two options are raw recording options, NRAW and ProRes RAW. And simply put, what this means is it's kind of like shooting raw in photo mode. This gives you the most flexibility when you're editing in terms of your exposure, contrast, colors, and so on. It also offers the most dynamic range, which is the, 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 the range from the brightest part of your image to the darkest part of your image. Now, NRAW does give you slightly smaller file sizes compared to ProRes RAW. So I'd recommend that if you do want to shoot any kind of RAW format, um, go for the NRAW option. Now, let's look at the other formats that are not RAW. And you will notice that you have ProRes and H.265 and H.264, and these are known as codecs or the compression of your video. ProRes offers the best quality available um, for a compressed video format, but it does come at a cost and that is also extremely large file sizes. You will also notice certain terminology such as 12-bit, 10-bit, and 8-bit, and this is known as bit depth or how much color information can be recorded within each pixel. The higher the number, the more color information can be recorded. But of course, this comes with a cost and that is larger file sizes as well. So what do all of these mean for you and which option should you pick? If you are planning to shoot any kind of high-end work like commercials, 
then I would strongly recommend going Enraw. If you are just filming casually, but you do want the best quality out of your footage, which means you're going to put in the effort to do things like color grading during post-production, then I would recommend going H.265 10 bits. But if you do want to record for longer periods of time, or you want to just get the footage directly out from the camera into your computer directly to upload uh, without any need for major post-processing, then I would suggest going for the 8-bit options since those have the smallest file sizes. Now, I think if we want to be a bit more serious in our filmmaking, then we should really learn to put in the effort to learn how to color grade our footages, which means the last options, the 8-bit options, are not an option anymore. So then we look at the other options, which are basically your 12-bit and your 10-bit um, options. So if you further click in, you will notice that there are two other choices that you can make, SDR versus analog. So SDR offers standard video colors, whereas if you click analog, you will notice that your image will look very grayish and washed out. In whichever codec and bit depth that you choose, I will always recommend going analog if you do want to color grade your footage. Analog will definitely give you the most flexibility when you are color grading. Now, I'm not a professional colorist and I'm not going to offer a full course on how to color grade your analog footage. So you can go and check other videos online on how to do that. Next in the video recording menu, let's look at frame size and frame rate. So if you click in there, uh, again, you'll be met with a bunch of different choices. Um, and you'll notice that the camera can shoot at a maximum resolution and frame rate of 6K 60p. Let me explain to you what all this means. First, let's take a look at frame rate, which is denoted in P. So you'll see over here, you have options like um, 60p, 50p, 25p, 24p, and so on. So frame rate refers to frames per second or how many frames are captured in one second of video recording. So let's go over the basics of this first. 24p is generally the broadcasting standard in cinemas. 25p is the broadcasting standards in certain countries like mine, Singapore whereas 30p is used as the standard broadcasting rate in other countries. So uh, you will also notice in other places, uh, other cameras, you know, they will refer to this as PAL or NTSC. So 25p um, is actually PAL while NTSC is 30p. So depending on the country that you reside in, you may want to choose between 25p and 30p as your base frame rate. And you'll also notice that there are options within this menu for multiples of that frame rate. For instance, 50p is a multiple of 2 of 25p, um, 60p is a multiple of 2 of 30p, and you know, like 100p is a multiple of 4 of 25p. What this means is that recording at this frame rate will allow you to create slow motion videos when you edit. For instance, if I shoot at 50p and I'm editing in a 25p timeline, I can slow my footage down by half. Or if I am recording at 100p, editing on a 25p timeline, I can slow my footage down by a quarter. Now, what a lot of people do by mistake is that, for instance, if they shoot at 50p and they want to try to slow their footage down to, you know, a quarter of the speed, then you will notice that there are all these choppy frames within the video itself, and that's not the right way to do it. So you have to know how much you want to slow your footage by, and record at the frame rate, which is suitable for that kind of slow motion. Then we look at resolution. We have different options within the Nikon Z63. You have 6K, 4K, as well as 1080p. 1080p or Full HD is the lowest possible resolution that you can film on this camera, and it takes up the smallest file sizes. 6K is the maximum that you can go here, uh, which gives you the most clarity and, of course, the best possible image, but it also um, causes very large file sizes. So what I find is a good in-between is actually shooting in 4K, which I personally like to do. And since most of my videos are on a 1080p or Full HD timeline, what this means is that it allows me to actually crop in to get a slightly different look or framing when I am editing. The next option within the video recording menu is image area. So if you click in there, you'll notice that you have two options, FX and DX. So basically what this means is whether you're choosing to use the full sensor or using a Super 35 or crop mode of that sensor. So if you have um, lenses that are full frame for full frame cameras, 
then of course you would use the FX mode or full frame mode. But you can also use it in crop sensor mode if you do want to get a little bit more reach. Um, however, if you're using crop sensor lenses, then you have to change it to DX mode because if you use it in full frame mode, you'll get this very strange vignette that's uh, surrounding the particular frame. So of course, there are many good um, crop sensor lenses out there and you can definitely put them onto your Nikon cameras if you want to, but just make sure to change it to DX mode when you're recording. So the rest of the video recording menu is fairly straightforward to understand. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get out of there and go into my quick menu and show you how I set it up for video recording. So this is how I set up my uh, quick menu. If you press the I button, you'll access the quick menu. And the very first option that I have over here is actually focus peaking. So um, you can choose to turn on or turn off focus peaking. And what this does is when you are um, manually focusing, for instance, then there will be this red outline that will show you the parts of the image that are in focus. So this is particularly helpful if you are you know, using lenses that are manual focus only, or if you are having trouble with the autofocus of your lens and you want to switch it to manual mode, manual focus mode, then you can definitely turn this peaking on. If you do not have a monitor, for instance, or, your, or a larger screen to look at your image, you know, if you're looking just through the back screen of your LCD, which is a fairly small screen, then sometimes you might not be able to just catch the correct focus um, with your eyes alone. And that's where focus peaking comes in. Having this outline that tells you which areas are in focus can be very critical if you want to nail perfect sharp focus. The next thing on my quick menu is white balance. And generally, I know that a lot of photographers are comfortable shooting in auto white balance, but for video, that's a completely different thing altogether. I would highly recommend against shooting auto white balance. In fact, what I'd recommend is to use a preset color temperature to film your videos. So for instance, in outdoor environments, I would go with 5600 Kelvin, that's daylight balance. And if you are perhaps indoor or in any other place with artificial lighting, then you'll need to match that color temperature to that particular um, lighting environment that you're in. Why is this the case? It's because when you are recording in auto white balance mode, um, we know whenever things happen within the frame or if you are moving your camera around, the white balance will change. And between shot to shot, your white balance may change as well. This will all look very strange when you piece your video together and you notice that the colors are actually different um, within each shot. And this makes it very jarring for the viewer. So stick to one color temperature and just go with that throughout the entirety of the scene or the environment that you are filming in. Then my next option is frame size, frame rate. Um, generally, I do shoot at 4K, so that's my default option, but you can change it to whatever frame rate or frame size that you want. The next option is audio input sensitivity. And generally, I do set this manually to a certain level that I like. If you set it on automatic mode, which I know is a default, and you're recording um, during quiet moments where you don't want any noise, the camera may actually boost that up for you and you will find noise uh, in, your, you know, in your audio when you don't want it to. So I keep mine at a constant level, especially if you're trying to record audio through the camera. Like for instance, right now when I'm recording my audio directly to a wireless lavalier that goes into my camera. For focusing modes, I won't go into too much detail. It kind of works the same way as in photo mode. But if you notice that your camera is constantly hunting the focus in video mode, you might want to switch out of, you know, uh, autofocus and go into manual focus. Now the Z6 III also has vibration reduction built into the camera. So usually I turn that on if I'm going to do any kind of handheld movements or moving the camera around. But if I'm locked off on the tripod and I know that the camera is not going to move, then I will turn the vibration reduction off because otherwise you may get these strange jello effects. Zebras are another useful feature. These will actually show you where the highlights are clipping. And I will usually turn this on when I want to make sure that my highlights are not clipping and I want to get the entirety of the dynamic range of the scene uh, within my image. And that's basically how I set up my quick video menu when I press I. Now let's look at what's on my camera screen when I am shooting in video mode. The first thing that you'll notice is that I have this 
uh, waveform that's on my screen instead of the traditional histogram. Now, waveforms are definitely the way to go if you're planning to record video seriously. I highly recommend using waveform because it gives you the most precise way to see luminance values across your frame. So how do you read the waveform? Now, from top to bottom, at the top, it represents the brightest parts of your image, and at the bottom, it represents the darkest parts of your image. But what's different about waveform compared to the traditional histogram is that you can actually see from left to right what's bright and what's dark across your frame. So it does correspond to the left to right of your image. This helps you to see the exposure across the frame, which a histogram cannot do. Then we'll look at the shutter speed. My shutter speed is twice of my frame rate, which means if I'm shooting in 25p, I need to have a shutter speed of 1 over 50. Or if I'm shooting at 100p, for instance, then my shutter speed will have to be 1 over 200. This is the rule for video. And if you notice that you're in outdoor conditions or brighter conditions, then you'll need to get an ND filter or a neutral density filter to put in front of your lens in order to bring down that shutter speed. The aperture can be set to whatever value that you want. But you'll notice that if you're shooting in analog, the lowest, the minimum ISO that you have available is actually ISO 800. And this is actually the native ISO for the Nikon Z63. What this means is that at this ISO, this camera will produce the best possible image. Of course, the Nikon Z63 is a low light beast. So if you do really need to push the ISO further up, you can definitely do so. But if you do want the best possible image coming out of this camera, especially if you are in controlled lighting environments, then I'd recommend just keeping to ISO 800. So there it is. This is a complete overview of the Nikon Z63 video settings that you can learn from and play with. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to check out my other video where I give my thoughts about using this camera. Alternatively, if you want to learn about how to make your Z63 footage look more cinematic in Premiere, make sure to check out my other video here.